2001, I made the change when I finally realized that the story about the, the Spanish Jews was real, not only historically, but in my family. When I realized this was a real story in my family, I made a change. It took me four years to, to come to that place. One of the things that happened when I made that change was a theological change. So I was part of an online uh, discussion forum in which we talked about theology and back and forth and all of that, and it was sponsored by a seminary. I wasn't a student in the seminary, but they opened it to the public, so I was a, I was a contributor in the forum, and I made uh, you know, some good friends and some enemies as well. You know how it is when you, ta- when you start talking religion or politics online, right? <laughs> and then right you know, in the middle of that, then I made that theological change. And I began to post messages and answer to and debate and, and discuss things from a different perspective. And the guys noticed, and they were like, whoa, this is amazing. Um, and then pretty quickly, we got the attention of the leaders of this seminary. And so a guy came online to moderate the discussions with the purpose, really, of shutting me down. And, <laughs> and so he came in and he, he, he invited me to debate him. So we were discussing all of those verses that you and I know in Galatians, in Romans, uh, in Matthew, in John, all of these uh, passages, and he wanted to debate me specifically on Galatians. But you know, I had learned a thing or two in life, and I wasn't afraid to say, I'm not ready for it. <laughs> so I kind of threw the guy a curb. You see, the guy had a, a doctor's degree in theology. He knew Greek and Hebrew. At the time, I didn't know any of that. I could find my way. I could study. I I was a good student, but I didn't know enough to to enter into a debate with him. So I said, maybe later, maybe down the road, because I knew I wasn't prepared. So I want to read a verse to you in the book of Matthew. It's Matthew 21, 43. Before we get into chapter 1, Matthew 21, 43, it says, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation producing its fruit. The kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation that will produce its fruits. And let me read what, I, uh, what a commentator said about this verse. He says that this is the most explicit statement in Matthew of the view that there is to be a new people of God in place of Old Testament Israel. Let me read it again. This is the most explicit statement in the book of Matthew of the view that there is to be a new people of God in place of Old Testament Israel. And that new people of God is the church. So in other words, this verse where it says that Yeshua said, the kingdom has been taken away from you and given to another nation, that is the key passage to say that the church has replaced Israel. So imagine that you are like me, you are writing online, you belong to an online forum, and somebody throws this verse at you. Now, you know that a statement like this, a statement of replacement theology, is not true. But how can you prove it? In other words, are you ready to defend your convictions and your beliefs? Are you ready? You know, back in 2001, I wasn't. I wasn't ready, and I knew it. And... I didn't feel bad admitting, even to a, to, to a group of people, even to a man with, with a, a, a degree in theology. 
I'm not ready. I don't know all the answers. This is one of the reasons why I want us to study the book of Matthew. Because I want us to find answers to these kinds of things. But here's the thing. More importantly, it is to answer these kinds of things that Matthew actually wrote. Isn't that amazing? Matthew wrote to, in, in, to, to correct and anticipate what we have been seeing for 2,000 years. Matthew is an answer to replacement theology. We're going to begin to see that today, and we're going to see it throughout our series as we, as we go throughout the book. How Matthew is an answer to replacement theology. Okay? All right. So I have a title for my message today. I'm calling it Understand and Love Israel. Understand and Love Israel. But this actually comes from a larger title. So I kind of reduced it a little bit so we can retain it, so we can remember. Understand and Love Israel. Here's, the, here's where, where the larger uh, title is. Understand Israel theologically so that you love them sacrificially. Understand Israel theologically so that you love them sacrificially. That's what Matthew is trying to tell us. He's trying to help us understand Israel theologically. What is happening with Israel? Because here's the thing. Matthew is writing in the 60s, around the, t the year 60-something. Uh, we don't know for sure, right? But the reason we know is because he shows that the destruction of the temple in the year 70 has not taken place yet. You know, in Matthew 24, he talks about the prophecy that Yeshua gave about the destruction of the temple, but it has not happened yet. So that's how we know that Matthew wrote before the year 70, okay? So probably in the late 60s. But he writes to, and we don't know this for sure, right? But, but uh, one of the options of who did he write to, the, who were the, uh, the recipients of this gospel, one of the options is that he wrote to the church, to the congregation in uh, Antioch. You may recall this congregation. It's a powerful congregation. Antioch was the first place where the disciples, after being scattered because of the stoning of Stephen, after they were scattered, they began to share the, the word. And in Antioch was, for the first time, they shared the gospel with Gentiles. For the first time. Now, I know we have uh, Acts uh, 10 and 11 where Peter shared the gospel with Cornelius and his family. Okay? This was like God has to really twist his arm to go there and to share the gospel. And he saw, wow, the Gentiles, you know, received the Holy Spirit. But as for the rest of the disciples, in planting a congregation intentionally, sharing the gospel to Gentiles, that actually happened in Antioch. And when this happened, the apostles who were in Jerusalem, they sent Barnabas. They sent Barnabas to, to, and he says that Barnabas saw the grace of God that was over this church. And so when Barnabas saw the ministry there, he quickly decided, oh, I need a, I need a, a buddy here. I need help. And so he went and found a man by the name of Saul, Saul of Tarsus, the apostle Paul. And he brought Saul with him. And it says that they ministered at that congregation and they taught for a whole year. And, and there were leaders there, powerful leaders, both Jews and Gentiles. We can tell by the names that some of them were Jews and some of them were Gentiles. Uh, possibly even a black man, 
an African man, because it, it, there is one by the, na- by the name of Niger, possibly an African man. So this was a, a powerful congregation with Jews, Gentiles, ethnically diverse, filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit in, in chapter thir- uh, 13 says, separate Paul and Barnabas for the ministry that I have for them. And they pray for them. They sent them. It was a great, great congregation. So this is the, the congregation to whom most likely Matthew writes. You see, Antioch was very, very close to Israel, just north in what today will probably be Syria, between Syria and Lebanon there. And there were lots of Jews there. Jews were already engaged in uh, this tug of war with, uh, with Rome that is going to eventually lead to the destruction of the temple in the year 70, but it didn't start in the year 70. So towards the mid and late 60s, you have Jews just getting out of Israel, getting out of Jerusalem. And many landed there in Antioch. That's why you see a gospel that is so profoundly Jewish that assumes a deep understanding of Pharisaic theology and behavior and flavor without having to explain too much, written to a congregation that is actually outside of Israel. So Matthew is writing to both Jew and Gentiles in this congregation of Antioch. And he is addressing a problem. He's addressing a problem. We're going to see this, this problem as we go through, uh, through our message today. He's going to address a problem, a very specific problem. And he begins in chapters 1 and 2. We're going to see how he opens a prologue. What, what, what we have in chapters 1 through 4 is a prologue, kind of like an introduction uh, in several chapters. In chapter 5, he's going to go full force into the teachings uh, of Yeshua 5 through 7. But in chapters 1 through 4, he is introducing the Messiah to his readers. Not because they didn't know who he, who he was, but he goes, because he has several purposes. The gospel itself is the good news. So it, it has a deep evangelistic uh, purpose. But it also is a discipleship tool. This is how they discipled new believers uh, in the first century, in the, in, the early, uh, in the early goings. By taking them through the story of the gospel. Uh, Luke writes about his gospel, and he says that the purpose is that you will be convinced of the things you already believe. So it isn't so much to gain new knowledge, but it is to go in-depth in the things that we know. And all of the gospels really have similar purposes, evangelistic, discipleship, and corrective. So uh, Matthew is, is, has a, a specific uh, corrective purpose, and we're going to see what, what Matthew is trying to correct here. So he begins his prologue, his introduction in chapters 1 through 4. Today we're going to see chapters 1 and 2. Next week we're going to see chapters 3 and 4. So in chapters uh, 1 and 2, he begins in verse 1, by giving us a statement. He's going to give us a statement, an opening summary. And then he's going to go into genealogy, right? We know, we know the gospel. He's going to go into genealogy. Then he's going to tell us about the birth of Messiah, chapter 1. In chapter 2, he's going to talk about these magi, magi that came from the east, these, uh, these men that came to follow this star, that's going to lead them to Bethlehem, and they're going to come and bring in uh, gifts and worship Yeshua. But then we're going to see how Herod 
and the, and the leadership are going to persecute and reject uh, the one who was born. And God has to protect him by sending the whole family to Egypt. And then when the enemies are dead, he brings them back and leads them to live in the north, in Nazareth, in the Galilee. That's chapters 1 and 2. We know, we know the content, right? We know the content. So what I want to do is, and you've heard me say this before, I don't just want to take you to Home Depot, right? When you go to Home Depot, you have everything you need to build a house. In fact, several houses. You have all the wood, the kitchen, the bathroom. You have everything. The point is not to take you to Home Depot and show you, hey, you know, this is all the, here are all the components. Give you an inventory of what goes into a house. Anybody can do that. Build me a house. Take all of the components and build me a house. Then I'll be impressed. Right? So it is not enough to list The content of Matthew, the content of Hebrews, the context of Acts, and and whatever book you want. Take the content and build me a theology. Uh, Come up with with a statement that summarizes not only the content, but the purpose. You know, what is the author saying? What is he talking about? What is he saying? And to what purpose? What is he trying to do with what he's saying? Build me a house. We're going to build a house here. We know the content. We're going to build a house uh, out of of this. So we're going to see how Matthew, here in in, in these two chapters, he first proves something. Then he anticipates something. And then he demands something. He's going to prove, he's going to anticipate, and he's going to demand. That's the three uh, aspects of these two chapters. So let's dive right in. Let's get into uh, verse 1, Matthew 1, 1. Matthew 1, 1, it says, The record... Of the genealogy of Yeshua, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. This is a summary statement. This is the book of the genealogy of Yeshua, the Messiah, the son of David, and the son of Abraham. So already he's telling you who Yeshua is. He's, he's speaking to us about the identity of Yeshua. So Matthew's prologue proves Yeshua's identity. That's what he's going to do. He's going to prove Yeshua's identity. The claims that he makes right in verse 1 is that Yeshua is the son of David and the son of Abraham. In that order. What does that mean? To be the son of David. You see, it means that Yeshua is Mashiach. The anointed one. The Messiah. We get the word Messiah from the Hebrew Mashiach. He is the Messiah, the anointed. That's what that word means. It means anointed. And when you translate it into Greek, it means Christ. Christos. Now, don't think this is a church word. They took it and it, it's, you know, we, we hear it and we, we think church, that's church. But guess what? The ones who used that word first were Jews when they translated the Tanakh into Greek. It's called the Septuagint. Septuagint comes from the word 70. And because they have 70 scholars, according to tradition, 70, 72 scholars, translating the whole Tanakh into Greek. They use the word, uh, when, when, when the Hebrew used Mashiach, they use the word Christos, anointed one. So he is saying, Matthew is saying, first, uh, in the first, thing, first line, Yeshua is 
the Messiah. He is the son of David. He is the king of Israel. He is the king of the Jews. And then he says that he is also the son of Abraham. The son of Abraham. Um, the seed of Abraham, I think, is, is better understood. Because all throughout Genesis, we see that word repeated. The descendants of Abraham, the descendants of Isaac, the descendants of Jacob. And the Hebrew use of the word, the seed, the seed, the seed, the seed. But the first time that the word seed is used is in Genesis 3. The seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. And the seed of the serpent will bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. So we're going to come back to that thought in a moment. Now, what Matthew is doing is very important in Second Temple Judaism. To bring somebody's genealogy. This actually began in the book of Ezra. You may recall in the book of Ezra, when you, when you read, there was a big deal made about the genealogies of all of those who came, the genealogies specifically of those who were Levites and priests and of the descendants of David. This was extremely important. And so this became important in Judaism so that in, this, in the time of the first century, you had to show proof. And they had the records. We don't have the records left over today. It was destroyed. But they still had the records. So much so that they could go in and check the records of Mary and Joseph. And they could tell you, yes, they are descendants of David. The angel, in one of the dreams that Joseph has in, in these chapters, the angel calls him Joseph, son of David. He is a descendant of David. And so it was important in Second Temple Judaism to show proof. So this is how Matthew is proving the identity of Yeshua. First and foremost, the genealogy says that he is the son of David that he is a Jew, that he is a seed, the seed of Abraham. So that's first line of proof. Um, what we have in, in the statement that Yeshua is the son of Abraham uh, is clarified in, in Galatians. So let's go to Galatians 3. Galatians 3.15. It's very convenient because, I'm, I'm sorry, Galatians 3.16. Because the first statement about the seed is in Genesis 3.15. The explanation of who the seed is is in Galatians 3.16. 3.15 in Genesis, 3.16 in Galatians. So let's read Galatians 3.16. It says, now, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, in plural, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed in singular. That is Messiah. The seed is the Messiah, the anointed one. So when God promised Abraham, you are going to have, uh, I'm going to multiply your seed. Yes, it had um, a plurality within the singular, the grammatical singular. It's kind of like today we can say the people of Fort Worth. Well, we're not just speaking about one person, right? The word people grammatically is singular, but we know it means a whole lot of people. I don't know, a million and a half <laughs> of us here in Fort Worth, or more maybe. So that's the same with the word seed. 
grammatically singular, it meant many, many descendants of Abraham, but singling particularly one, the seed, the Messiah. So, he is singl- Matthew is singling out Yeshua as the foremost of Jews, the Jew of Jews, the seed of Abraham, Yeshua himself. When we then switch over to reading the, the birth, the accounting, the narrative of the birth of Yeshua, we get a further explanation as to what the seed actually means. Let's read quickly through verses, uh, beginning in verse um, 2. Beginning in verse 2. No, I'm sorry, beginning in verse 18. We're going to go through uh, to the second half here, verse 18 in the narrative of Yeshua's birth. So verse 18 says, Now the birth of Yeshua, the Messiah, was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Now, we know this fact, but we need to understand the meaning of this fact theologically. The fact that he is, or that she was uh, conceived, that she conceived by the Holy Spirit, it means that he is God. And because he is her son, he is man. He is both at the same time and fully. He is fully man. He is fully God. And we have to accept this as a mystery. We have no other way, no other example to point to to verify that this is what that is. You see, science works by experimental verification, right? For something to be true of science, you have to be able to duplicate it over and over again and verify it. Well, this blows out science. because You cannot make another one conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of a woman. Only one. The one and only Son of God. So this speaks of his uh, double nature, his divinity and his humanity. So verse 19. Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph ben David. Amazing, huh? Joseph, son of David. Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua. For he will save. His name is Savior because he will save his people from their sin, from their sins. Verse 22. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. So what, what Matthew is doing here is showing through miracles and through fulfillment of prophecy He's proving that Yeshua is the Messiah. He already proved it through genealogy. He has a right to be called king of Israel. He's a straight descendant of Abraham. That proves his identity. Let me show you further proof. The miracles around his birth show his his divine uh, origin. So the miracles about around his birth... And the fulfillment of prophecy in his birth also prove his identity, that he is God. But um, verse, uh, verse 22. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name... God with us. 
Emmanuel. With us is God. You see, that is further proof that he is God incarnate in the form of a man. He dwells among us. He's another human being, but he is God. He is God with us. So through fulfillment of prophecy, Matthew proves his identity, who he is. Which translated is God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. And he called his name Yeshua. So Matthew's prologue, we're at the end of chapter 1. Matthew's prologue, his introduction, proves Yeshua's identity through genealogy, through miracles, through fulfillment of prophecy. Now, I want to take a, a, a moment to give you a little extra on the side, okay? Because if you didn't know, tomorrow is Christmas, Well, you're probably thinking, all right, (laughs) this guy really lost it now. (laughs) All right, let me tell you what I'm talking about, okay? You see, today is the last month, it's the last day of the month of Adar. In fact, today is uh, Shabbat HaChodesh, Shabbat HaChodesh. So it's the, the, the Sabbath of the moon of the new moon, of the new month, because it's the last one before uh, before Nisan begins, the month of Passover, right? So in two weeks, Nisan 14, we're going to have Passover. So tomorrow is the first day of Nisan, the first day of the first month, the first day of the first month. I want you to come with me very quickly to the end of Exodus. Because today, together, we ended the reading of Exodus, didn't we? In fact, before the service started, Michelle, my wife, uh, was led of the Lord to read chapter 40 of Exodus. And she didn't know this was going to be part of my message today. (laughs) So in chapter 40... It's the end of Exodus, the end of the building of the tabernacle. Everything is completed. They're going to now put it together. They put it together. It's going to be anointed, and and it was anointed. And the presence of the Lord came down, and he filled the tabernacle. So much so that Moses could not go in. The Lord was so filling the tabernacle, his glory His presence was touching everything, touching everything, touching everything. What happened with the woman that touched Yeshua's garment? Life. Whoa. Tremendous infusion of life came into her. Contact with the divine infuses with life. So here comes the glory of God and makes contact with everything in the tabernacle. Guess what happened? Everything became holy, sanctified. It became sanctified by, by infusing it with oil, but even more so because God himself came and he touched everything. He touched everything. So much so that Moses couldn't even get in. Amazing. So, for us, it's important to know when this happened. Because this text is going to tell us. Uh, Verse 17. Exodus 40, verse 17. Look what it says. It says, now, in the first month... Of the second year, on the first day of the month, 
the tabernacle was erected. First month is Nisan. First day of the month. That's what we have tomorrow. That's the day when the tabernacle was erected and the glory of God came down and touched everything. Come with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. We're not going too far from Matthew 1. Because Matthew 1 is telling us when the Son of Man, when, the, when, the, when God became a man. And that's what we're doing here. We're talking about Christmas. <laughs> totally throwing you off, right? Chapter 1 of John, verse 14. You know this verse. Verse 14. John 1, 14. It says, And the Word became flesh... Right? That's Matthew 1. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. We saw His glory. He dwelt among us. In the uh, older versions, you read, He tabernacled among us. Because in the Greek... That's what the word means. It takes the word for tabernacle and turned it into a verb. And so he tabernacled among us. In uh, Exodus 40, we see how the glory of God came down to the tabernacle to dwell. The God of Israel came to dwell among the Jewish people. The God of Israel in his glory came to tabernacle with man. When Yeshua became a man, he came to tabernacle among us. The glory of the only begotten came to dwell among us. That is the day when he became a man. When he became a man. So, out of all of the possible dates for Christmas, you know, is it in this month? Is it in that other month? You know, Messianics are, the, the favorite time is Sukkot. But here's the problem with Sukkot, though. That the Sukkah, the, the Sukkot, you know, which we get our name from it, right? Sukkot Shalom, a, a tabernacle of, of peace, right? Um, these tabernacles, these Sukkot, they're not made for God to dwell. God never came to a Sukkah to dwell. He came to the tabernacle, to the Mishkan, not to the Sukkah. So if we read in John 1 that he came to a Sukkah, I'm sorry, but that's just not correct. He came to the Mishkan to tabernacle among us. And that happened the first day of Nisan. It so happened to, and I'm going to conclude this part with this, okay? It so happened that I remember when I was a little boy and I was learning about dogs, and I learned that dogs, you know, uh, the female dog was in heat. All right. <laughs> um, and then later on, they had kids, right? They had little dogs. Well, guess what? The same happens with the sheep. Only that the sheep, they come into heat only one time of the year. Only one time. Only one time. So all of the, the lady sh uh, sheep, they all get pregnant at the same time. And all of them give birth at the same time. It's called lambing season, when all the lambs are being born. They're all born very close in proximity of time. And guess what? In Israel, in that, at that time, it was at the beginning of spring. It was at the beginning of Nisan. So you have two very strong uh, arguments that say 
that the Lamb of God most likely came to dwell, to tabernacle among us at the time when the lambs were being born because the sheep were out in the field because the, their sheep were giving birth. That's why they were out in the field at night. So that the Lamb of God came on lambing season, this time where the, where the lambs were born, which, which happens to be the same time when the glory of God came to tabernacle among us. Two very strong reasons that are absent of all the other dates. And so, tomorrow is Christmas. Merry Jewish Christmas. <laughs> but I digress. <laughs> And we go back to, uh, now to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew's prologue proves Yeshua's identity by his uh, genealogy, by the miracles, by the fulfillment of prophecy. But Matthew's prologue also anticipates Yeshua's acceptance and rejection. And this is extremely important because now we begin to see uh, the problem that Matthew is addressing. In chapter 2, we're going to see a foreshadowing, an anticipation, the beginnings of the acceptance of Yeshua and his rejection. And these two things are going to be a major theme in the rest of the book, okay? So, for the sake of time, we're not going to read uh, these long sections, partly because we are very familiar with the content of Matthew. But we have these two themes in Matthew running uh, very deeply in Matthew 2. That these men, these Magi from the east, they come to worship the king of the Jews. The star led them. Let me read to you um, Numbers 24, verse 17. Numbers 24, 17. It says... I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob. A scepter shall rise from Israel and shall crush through the forehead of Moab and tear down all the sons of Sheth. The star is a reference to the scepter, to the one from Jacob that will be king, that will have a scepter. So a star leads them to where the king is, right to the house, over the house in Bethlehem. And they worship him. But who are they? They are Gentiles. So right from the beginning, Matthew is saying Gentiles will accept Yeshua because he is the seed of Abraham. In you, Abraham, all the nations will be blessed. So Gentiles are coming and they are accepting. But what happens uh, with the leadership of the Jewish people that we see here? Um, in verse 3, uh, Matthew 2, 3, it says, When Herod the king heard this, by the way, Yeshua is called the king of the Jews. The Magi, they say, we came to worship the king of the Jews. But it never says of Herod that he is the king of the Jews, even though he was the king of Judea. But he was never the king of the Jews. He was not a Jew. So when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, gathering together all the chief priests, you see the, the leadership of Israel, all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea. What is the meaning of that? He is the son of David. 
He's the son of David by genealogy, and he is born in Bethlehem, just like David. And, and we have the quote there from Micah, uh, fulfillment, fulfillment of prophecy. We know Herod is going to try to trick the Magi, inquiring about the time, and then he is going to kill every child two years and younger. Also in fulfillment of prophecy. Yeshua will be accepted by Gentiles, and he will be rejected by the Jewish people, by the leadership of the Jewish people. But in the middle of that, a remnant will follow him. Joseph and Mary, they represent this remnant of Jews who are going to follow Yeshua. And the Gentiles will be grafted into them. You see, that is the problem that Matthew is addressing. He proves that Yeshua is son of David, son of Abraham. He proves his identity. He also uh, demand. Uh, I'm sorry. He also anticipated his rejection, his acceptance, and his rejection in chapter two. But overall, Matthew's prologue also makes a demand. Matthew demands that we respond. To Israel now, to what's happening to Israel now. So let me share with you what I think the problem that Matthew is answering is. I'm going to tell you first the problem, then I want to tell you his answer, okay? So here's the problem. The problem is that we don't understand, and this is true in the time of Matthew, of course, we don't understand why Yeshua didn't fulfill the kingdom promises to Israel. How come the Messiah came and we don't have Israel in the kingdom and as, as leaders of the nations? What went wrong? What happened? Why is it that Yeshua did not fulfill the kingdom promises to Israel. Why? You see, we don't understand that. That is true of us today. That was true in Matthew's time. The people at the congregation of Antioch, they needed to be reminded of this problem. They were losing, you know, as people were coming in, as more people were coming to faith, they were beginning to forget why Yeshua did not establish his promised kingdom to Israel in his first coming. So that was a problem. They needed to understand why. And also they needed to understand when he would return to do so. When he would return to establish the kingdom. The prophecies of Matthew, of Yeshua in Matthew, they tell us how to look for his coming. And also, they needed to understand what is happening to Jews and Gentiles in the meantime. In between his two comings, what is God doing with Jew and Gentile? Matthew wrote to address that lack of understanding. And he had two reasons for it. You see... The problem with the lack of understanding is not that people are ignorant. The problem is what people do with that lack of understanding. You see, so the dangers were that they would become disloyal, disloyal to Israel. He wrote to correct their understanding so they wouldn't become disloyal to Israel. And that they wouldn't disengage from blessing Israel. Those were the two dangers that ultimately he is trying to correct. Do not become disloyal to the nation of Israel. 
do not disengage with the Jewish people. Continue to bless them. And you know, tragically, what happened? That eventually, even though the congregation of Antioch lasted for until about the 4th century with a strong Jewish presence, we see leaders, bishops, coming from Antioch beginning to write in anti-Semitic ways. The problem that Matthew saw became a reality. And the congregation of Antioch, along with all the, the early church, began to become disloyal toward Israel. And they disengaged from Israel and did not continue to bless Israel. It is amazing that in all of literature, uh, I read this from a scholar that, that pointed this out, a, 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 a tremendous insight, that in all of the, the church fathers' literature, we read nothing about a compassionate view of the destruction of the second temple and the dispersion of Israel. There is not a single word written from the church fathers showing compassion toward Israel because of the destruction of the temple and the expulsion of the Jews from Jerusalem. Nothing. They were disengaged. They were disloyal to Israel. And we've had 2,000 years of that. Do you see how Matthew's message is so relevant for us today? It's this lack of understanding of why, uh, of, of interpreting this rejection, as we read in Matthew 21, 43, I think it was. I've taken the kingdom away from you and given it to another nation. The lack of understanding of all of Matthew leads people to misinterpret that verse. And they become disloyal toward Israel. They embrace replacement theology. Israel has been replaced by the church. And they stop blessing the Jewish people. They're not a special nation. Very real problems. Let me tell you Matthew's solution. Matthew's answer to this, to this huge problem. Understand Israel theologically and love them sacrificially. That's Matthew's response. That's his solution to the problem. Understand Israel theologically and love them so that you can love them sacrificially. I want to suggest to you three ways to do this. Because this addresses our mind first. We need to understand Israel. We have to use our mind to understand the theological arguments that are going on here. We have to invest. We have to work hard at doing this. I'm going to suggest to you that you invest money and time and effort in reading one specific book. It's called, uh, Has the Church Replaced Israel? That's the name of the book. Has the Church Replaced Israel? It's, uh, the author is Michael Vlack, V-L-A-C-H. V is in Victor, L-A-C-H, Michael Vlack. Has the church replaced Israel? You will read about the church fathers. You will read about theology, about Matthew, about uh, Romans. It, you are going to have to use your brain with this book. But you have to invest in understanding. You have to understand Israel theologically. What is happening with Israel theologically at this time? 
you also have to engage your heart. You see, you have to love Israel. And more specifically, you have to be loyal to Israel. Matthew is writing, so we understand in order to become loyal to Israel. You see, loyalty is the response to covenant. Chesed in Hebrew. Loyalty is the response to covenant. Time after time, God said, I am faithful to this king because he is a son of David. I am faithful to this king because he is a son of David. Even though the kings were progressively more and more apart from his heart, God remained faithful to the kings. And as a matter of fact, to the whole nation because of his covenant. This is covenant loyalty. Gentiles were brought in to the covenant of the Jewish people. Covenant loyalty is what's required to demonstrate loyalty to Israel. Hard loyalty to Israel. So with our mind, we need to understand theologically. With our heart, we need to be loyal to Israel. And with our will, we need to engage. We need to engage. And I'm going to propose to you that we engage with Israel um, in the growth and development of the body of Messiah in Israel. Yes, we can buy ambulance and we can support Holocaust survivors. We don't need to stop that. But we need to bless the family of God. We need to bless Israel to grow the body so many more come to know the Messiah and to uh, develop the body, develop leaders and, and, uh, that will grow the, and lead the, the body in Israel. We need to engage our understanding theologically of Israel. We need to love with a loyal heart, and we need to engage in blessing Israel in doing so specifically, specifically by giving sacrificially to the body, to the growth and development of the body in Israel. All of this is what Matthew is leading us to. And we're going to continue to develop these themes as we work through our series. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray.